I have no idea. Depends on whether we have the, whether we can travel or not. Because we're doing so many shows now, I don't know if I could even do it. Handle another one. A lot of time away from work.
Good evening again, my dear friends. Um, Typo 2018 comes to its end now with the final talk by Underwear. I hope you all enjoyed Typo as I do. I think it was a great event, many inspirational talks, and a huge variety of topics that speakers from all over the world brought to us. This was our 23rd Typo conference, and it was the fourth under Monotypes Care. And as I promised in the years before, the mentality and the quality of Typo will be the same. And I hope you feel it uh, as I do. Or even better, for example, we established the new Typo Labs conference, we started with Brand Talks last year, and we added the Talent Talks this year. Expect the larger change next year. I already announced it, mainly because we can't use this building next year. Whatever building or city it will be, uh, if a different city, it will be in Germany, that can promise you. And it depends on the building we find. We'll do our best to deliver the same values as always next year. This conference would not be possible without the help of many, many people. Some are visual, visual for you, of course. Others are not visible. But I'd like to change that in the following three minutes. First, I'd like to thank all our speakers and all our sponsors. We had hundred and more than 100 speakers. We've never had more speakers. Please, well, please. So, I'd like to thank the facilitators, the MC, Kali, Indra, Johannes, Steven, and Wiebke, please. Thank you. I'd like to thank the interpreters, Astrid Giese, Tanja Barbian, Jana Zweiron, and Leo Barminz. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to thank our technical company for the projections. It's BTL, thanks a lot. And Ape Unit, who did the video live stream and the download videos. We did a lot of videos, and uh, we had the help of Sven and Sebastian for the video documentation. Thank you very much. As I, and I, like, I know that you all follow our um, social media channels, Instagram, Twitter, and so on. We have more than 20 editors, and they were you know, um, led by Sabine and Matthias. Please, all editors and Matthias. Come up on stage. <laughs> Editorial team, please come up on stage. So, you, you, you've ha you have already seen a lot what they've published. You know, we have podcasts, we have videos, we have illustrations, we have blog posts, but you know, most of those pieces will be published after the conference, so stay tuned. This year we had five photographers, Gerhard Kastner, Norman Possel, Sebastian Weiss, Mark Eckert, and Anna, help me, please. Lisa. <laughs> so, your, your conference bag, the stage um, design, and uh, the merchandising things you found around this building was done by Claudia Gominski. <laughs> the identity, the visual identity of the conference, as always, is done by Studio Ad Hoc, Magnus and Steffi. If you're here, come up on stage, please. Thank you. Uh, responsible for logistics and sponsoring was Carlo. Since half a year, we already have a team member from USA, 
It's Gwen Steele. She was chief of protocol. Gwen? <laughs> Anna, she took care of the speakers, that they are always in good mood, and she, has, she always composed part of the program. Anna. <laughs> Is Lorena here? Okay, Lorena, she took care of at least 120 crew members, and whoever is from the crew here, please come up on, on stage. <laughs> Finally, of course, mastermind of typo, Benno, this year with Erna. Benno and Erna. So, and the, the last thank you is for you. Thank you for coming. All right, it's not over. Uh, our next, uh, I can't say speaker, because it goes beyond that. I don't even know what's on the stage here and why. Um, underwear is, is a, a trio of type designers, but I feel like they're... Oh, we have one more person to thank. <laughs> Niels. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> He's the stage director, and he's perfect. Yes, thank you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't hear anybody if it wasn't for Niels, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, underwear is a trio of type designers, but they're, they're much more than that. I feel like maybe they do type design just so they have an excuse to do other things. Um, when I was working at Font Shop a few years ago, and we would, uh, we would have to you know, do marketing for new releases, uh, it was always exciting when Underwear was releasing something new because you knew they were going to do something really strange, really exciting, really interesting. Uh, there was a time that they would release, they released a type specimen that came with their typeface sauna, and you could only read certain parts of the specimen if you were in a sauna. That was just one example of many, many that really turned people's heads, uh, made people think, and um, they were always surprising people. And usually when I introduce someone, I like to have a little discussion beforehand, talk about what they're going to talk about, give a little, uh, a little hint at what it might be. But in this case, I chose not to because I just love being surprised by these guys. So please welcome Underwear. Last year, we had a lecture at the same conference, 
And the nice thing about Typo Berlin is that every lecture has a title which is typographic. So we thought we give it a rather strange title. There was this character in there which nobody knew what it was. It is a character, it's a letter. Um, but it was rather confusing for people because the lecture was called from A to something strange there. And then uh, it's from A to We. And We is a, a, a Canadian syllabic. And you can actually, it works in a browser. So in the URL bar, you can even use it in. It's a, it's a, if you type this, this XN, you will get there. Um, but this Canadian syllabic, it's official uh, language in uh, Canada. So you have a trilingual uh, traffic sign, one French, one English. And then one, the top one is in Cree. And the difference between uh, French and English, uh, French and English are, they are using uh, uh, Consonants and vowels, but Cree is only using uh, syllables. So what's the difference is when we have an alphabet, there's always a combination of a, a consonant and a vowel. So we have N and E, and by uh, syllabics, it's always a combination. So this one sign, what we see, is pronounced as uh, we. And the interesting thing with those like special signs used by uh, like the Canadian uh, Aboriginals is that uh, they are working on, uh, on the internet and it actually allows you to also register URLs with this one letter. And by, this, uh, by doing that, you can actually register like a, a single letter top level domain name, which is normally not allowed. So in that way, we can, could register this uh, we.com, which is actually the URL of our uh, website. So we gave this presentation from A to We, and uh, uh, afterwards people came to us and said like, yeah, it was quite nice, but what are you actually doing at all? And we try to take this as a compliment. <laughs> Quest so, questions are always important. So we thought like, to not get the same question again this year, we, we are very clear in the beginning. So what we actually do is this, like we design letters, we design typefaces, and this is also where the problem starts because when you design this, you also design this, like a text, and then you also design this, this like we sign, but, and this goes on and on, so you also design this. And probably that's also the, uh, it's very interesting with uh, type design that this makes it very different with any other like uh, creative uh, sectors, I believe. Because whenever there's this, uh, when you design type, when you work with uh, type, there's this strange relation between form and content. The content and the form, they are always like somehow oscillating and they are not possible without each other. Yeah, so if you have a letter, if you have a capital I or lowercase a, it, it's a certain shape, and because it's a certain shape, it becomes a letter lowercase a, but a lowercase a defines like how the letter already should look like. So basically, we don't know like, if they can be separated at all. It's not only for single letters. Oh, sorry. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> it's not only for uh, single letters, the same goes for, word, uh, for words, because you can have uh, words there and then, uh, uh, like the word on top, it says short, but it's also a short word. Or the last word, like it's, it says word, but it's by itself all already a word. And those words are actually called autological words. And at the same moment, there's also something different possible with uh, language, like especially when it's uh, spoken. And those are like uh, uh, homophonic words. So for example, if you would have uh, the tail or a tail, it would not be clear for you like which tail I mean when I say you have to look at the tail. The same goes for one word. If you have one word, it could be one word, or it could be one word. <laughs> so what it actually means for uh, type? 
it's a good question. We're trying to figure this out. Um, what Gerard Noordzij uh, once said, uh, he uh, got famous as a teacher in Holland, very influential for tie designers. He uh, once said, like, a letter is basically only two shapes. That's like one light shape and one dark shape. And that's... Yeah. That's again the problem. Like, when you look at the uh, type, there is always, like, only one shape what you see. Like, for example, here you only see the white shape, but you don't see the black shape. And if you wait a little bit, it changes because now you can only see the black shape, but you cannot see the white shape. Yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> so, it's always this uh, uh, game with the shapes with when you design type. And so we also try to, uh, to, uh, to play around with that. So once we made a, a logo type, and it's kind of abstract, but if you look carefully, there's like a, it makes all sense. Like uh, the first letter is a U, second one is a N, and so on. So it says uh, underwear. And the reason why it looks so strange is because what you can actually do with this logo type is you can just rotate it by 180 degrees, and it doesn't change. So there's even more than probably two shapes, because if you look again at those letters, now that we rotated it to 180 degrees, you can see that there's not only like the basic letters there, but there's also the other ones which are rotated 180 degrees. And again, if you rotate it again, you get the same uh, uh, thing. They are still there, like... Uh... <laughs> Same goes for one shape. Like, basically, this is just one shape. It's just very simple. There's nothing else than just a single shape. But maybe there's much more in this one shape as we can imagine. So if you would cut this one shape, and you will uh, say, like, okay, if I just cut it there in the middle, I get a six. But as soon as you cut out a six, you get a five with it as well. So we're not sure, like with black and white shapes, like what's al already in there, what's not in there yet. Uh, this is another shape, and uh, many people will see, will see this shape, they will just see a, a waving hand. This is actually the sponsored message of the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as you put it in the context, you can probably start to read letters out of it. So a shape can contain many different uh, layers of content. So perhaps it makes sense to try to define like more a general concept like what letters are and basically perhaps it's just about that language make letters make language readable but also somehow accessible. So you see this very good like when uh, uh, little kids start to, uh, to write or when they see their, their parents like uh, writing they also try to make those letters accessible for themselves, that they can somehow like understand or grasp what language is about. So that's like the first letter of uh, Buster's daughter when she was uh, five. Which is interesting because kids, they are completely free in their mind, and then suddenly they have to fit into the system of adults, what every, the whole system, what we figured out, how the world should be, and they have to learn the script. And for them, like a vertical stroke with as many horizontal strokes, it's still the same thing, which is interesting. Like, we are spoiled, we think, like, no, this is not, cannot be true. So when they start to write, like, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, you make a B, and you, you know there's something with a loop, and then, oh, wait, doesn't look like, well, make another loop, and then let's... It's still a, a B for them, like, there's no difference. They, they have a completely open, free mind. So there's this uh, uh, saying from uh, Picasso, like, it took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. And basically, maybe you could question, like, if the same thing could happen uh, for us when we start to learn how to write. So maybe you could say that once you can, uh, once you are able to write, then it means your childhood is over because you're stuck into the system. We don't and, know. Yeah. And that's perhaps also a very big problem when you design typefaces that 
you should also try to design typefaces in a way that you don't know what type design is about. So the same what Picasso tried to do. But that's, of course, very difficult. Like, whenever we start designing typefaces, we are, like, very much, like, defined by what we think things have to be. So when we sometimes get commissioned to make a logotype, we also try to surprise ourselves and also try to approach like a, a typography and a type design in a more like free way. That whenever you make letters, it's not only like the letters we know, but perhaps you can also design the letters we do not know yet. And that those letters are not only letters, but that there's also this like form and content, and that there, that there is perhaps also a kind of content which is beyond the letters which we know already. So when we have this thing, like what we see here, it looks perhaps uh, very like strange, and it's like somewhere between an image and letters. But again, once you look closer to it, it all makes sense, because it's actually this uh, like EDL, which is standing for Embedding Design in Life, which was like the slogan of the Helsinki World Design Capital of uh, 2012. But at the same moment, of course, we also see that this is kind of an image, and it, it seems it looks like a familiar to us. <coughs> Ronnie James, you, he, he claims himself that he invented the, uh, the pommes gabel in German. And the interesting thing is with this pommes gabel, uh, it's now an official character. Uh, it has its own Unicode. And probably everybody knows the Unicode, it's an official number for every character, uh, for every script there. This is now part of the emoji, official emoji. And of course, Unicode wants to be very politically correct, so they get it in any skin color, of course. So you, you don't rule out, it's very inclusive. Um, but if you look carefully, that this is not the sign what we made, because we made this sign. I, cannot, I need my other hand, I cannot even do this. And luckily, since... Uh, uh, Last year, this also has its own Unico now. <laughs> and it's called I Love You Hand. So again, it's all about this problem that typography is as much as about form as it is about content. So when we design a letter, when we write, when we use a letter, we always communicate somehow, even in the most simple way when I put, just put this letter E and I say I. And in that way, when we uh, design a, a typeface, like uh, for example here, uh, Duos Brush Pro, it's not only a letter, but there's also content. And at the same moment, when like, there's this uh, English artist, uh, uh, Mark Wallinger, who makes uh, his self-portraits, which looks like this, he's not only like drawing a painting, but he's also like uh, writing the, the letter I which is a self-portrait of himself. So we have these letters, we have these words, we have text, and um, uh, we are questioning ourselves uh, what everything separately means and how they are related to each other. So you could say, for example, there are three parts. There's a type designer, there's a designer, and there's a reader. And the uh, type designer is uh, making the letters, the designer is using the letters, and the reader is reading those letters. So you could say that there's an ABC of type. There's the author, there's the builder, and there's the consumer. Um, so first, we're going to start with the type designer. The type designer makes the letters. And if you make a letter, the first thing you need to have is a good idea. If you don't have an idea, then you should not even start. Like first, you need to have an idea. Uh, after you have an idea, you need to have the tools to create it. And then... Then the outcome for the type designer can be anything. Like, uh, can look like anything. Depends on your idea and depends on the tool which you're using. So these are some of uh, self-portraits, only a capital I from some fonts which we made. So if anybody after the lecture comes, like, what are you actually doing? Then this is what we are doing. Like, this is now super clear. And for type designers, it's very interesting to see that in the last uh, 20 years, there was, of course, this change from uh, traditional media to uh, internet. So printed matter changed to uh, 
to websites. And of course, the, the, the change is much bigger. It's because it's not only like here with uh, like printed matter which changed, but also like this change of print to digital is part of a much bigger development of from static to dynamic. And as much as we saw this change, like now for the last 20 years, from uh, print to HTML, for example, and the interesting thing with this change is that in the beginning, like in 1996, when Netscape was starting up, we all didn't take it very serious. We thought, like, yeah, that's just like a kind of variation of, uh, of printed matter, but it changed everything radically. And at the same moment, what, what happened with uh, the media also happened now with uh, typefaces, as you probably already heard on the conference, that now there's this new development for making fonts, which changes like from static fonts to variable fonts. And those variable fonts, they behave, uh, or they are in relation with traditional fonts, perhaps the same way as like a website or HTML to printed matter. So in that way, I think it's very exciting to imagine like what work could this uh, lead us to? Like, what will this whole development be about? But like, for the people who don't know about variable fonts, like normally if you have a website, then uh, or the fonts are static. They are like just as they are designed by the type designer. But in the future, if we use like a variable fonts, a font can change from any form to any other form. So in that way, a font is not static. So what you see here, this is like all just one typeface which is doing whatever we want it to do. Like here, it's just just changing from uh, the weight, like from thin to, uh, to black. Yeah, so the magic word of the conference, uh, of the typo world at the moment, uh, already failed, like Key mentioned it, it's variable fonts. It's the big new thing, everybody, it was interviews two years ago and everybody's talking about it, everybody's working and playing with it. Um, we are actually wondering what it actually is. And uh, uh, there are many things unknown. We, we, we don't know, we still don't really know what it is. Uh, we even don't know how to pronounce it. Um, officially, this is the, how you pronounce it. And then you can see, like, you can see variable, or maybe variable, or maybe you should pronounce it differently all the time. The problem has to do, I think, <laughs> with, like, Europeans, we tend to pronounce it, like, as a German word, uh, variable, where I able fonts, but this is not correct. So do not pronounce it that way. That's how it should be pronounced. <laughs> is like variable, variable. So that's like the Eselsbrücke to remember how to pronounce the word correctly. Very able fonts. And then just a little bit quicker, variable fonts. So the problem, I think, with these variable fonts is that uh, before, now we have, until now, we always had static fonts, digital static fonts, and they have a separate bold, separate regular, separate light, separate black. And uh, everybody's happy because we can put this all into one font file. So you say, like, okay, that's cool. We put all our weights from light to black into one font file, and then we have a variable font. That's the first thing which comes to your mind, what you can do. And that's what everybody probably is going to do in the coming years. And you should question like, if that's the right decision, like, if that's a, a good thing. And maybe you can compare it uh, 20 years ago when the uh, internet got more widespread. Uh, everybody was doing this. And now you will probably look at it and say, like, yeah, it's ridiculous. But everybody was doing it because it was just possible. And the same thing is happening at the moment with variable fonts. Everybody's doing this with, as a variable font. And yeah. so you should question, like, if you put all these fonts into one font, like just one style with one slider, and you just go there from uh, light to black, if that's really the most essential thing of a variable font. Uh, another problem is that uh, this t technology was uh, announced two years ago. And meanwhile, it's implemented in all web browsers, but it's not yet really very good implemented in uh, design programs. The problem is also that we believe when a font becomes variable, then the interface is also part of the font design. So as a font designer, we do not only have to design the font in the future, like in the context of variable fonts, 
but we also have like, the interface, how to work with this font, is part of the font design. So this is what we did with uh, this typeface, like uh, Zeitung. There we just um, made a little extension, what you can uh, use in Illustrator and InDesign. And with this extension, you can access and work with this variable font how we intended it to work. So you can use it to build your own families, for example. Yeah. So what you get now with variable fonts and Illustrator, like you have all these sliders, and people get lots and lots of sliders. And the question is if you need all the sliders or not, or if you need an in a different interface which fits really to this font. So this is a plugin from two years ago, right after the introduction of this new font format. So we show a little uh, uh, film how this works in uh, Illustrator or InDesign. But you could question, of course, like we're still figuring out what these variable fonts are, what they really, what they really are. Like if this is, this is one thing, but maybe there's much more. So if you try to think more, uh, as, my, as my daughter, you try to think in a much more free way about what a variable font could be. So if you can make something from legible to illegible, maybe. Or uh, maybe you can make something from uh, uh, Braille uh, to Latin. So basically what we found out is that there is actually a connection between uh, Braille and Latin and that we can connect, we can put this into a variable font and in that way make those like being connected through an uh, axis, what we call the readability axis. So here's the Latin and now we have uh, But you can go one step further, because if a Latin letter can change into uh, Briar, then it can also change into another Latin letter, probably. So why not making one letter, which can be any other letter? So the A can change into the E, but also into a G or into a K. So what's very important is to realize, like what you see there is really a typeface, so it's not a movie. And this typeface is built in, an, in that way that any letter can be changed into any other letter. So it's a kind of uh, 26 dimensions where we can go from any letter to whatever we want. And still it's all like that's the new typography somehow. Well, what's, what's the possibility with the uh, variable fonts? But I think that's important what you just said, like it's still a font. This is not like a movie, like an animation or something, it's a font. And if you have this font where every letter can be any other letter, then uh, any text can be any other text. So you can turn water into wine. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, the problem with uh, those inline fonts, it's quite often that uh, the designer has to decide like how this inline really looks like. And quite often we want to have it then just a little bit different, like uh, sometimes we want to have it thicker or thinner. So that's also very easy to do in uh, variable fonts. So when we have like this, we can just create again like different dimensions. Like for example here we have one dimension which actually creates the thickness of the inline. Then we just add another dimension where we can uh, define like the thickness of the whole letter. And then to, we make another dimension, like a third dimension. And there we define the inline in the inline. So in that way you can create your own uh, version, how you want to have it. 
Again, like you just use it in uh, InDesign or Illustrator, and then there's like endless uh, uh, possibilities. And there's also a little film, I think, which yeah. shows it in, oh yeah, here it is. So this is how the same font would then look like in Illustrator. Illustrator now supports variable fonts. So that's in the latest version of uh, uh, Adobe Illustrator, which supports those fonts like uh, natively. So you just select it and you have the different axis and by this you control how the appearance is of this uh, font. So we have the variable font and we're still figuring out what it could be because it, if it can change from letter to briar or can let any letter letter can turn into any other letter letter, then somehow it's like this <laughs> magic thing. And if you go back to the static and the dynamic thing again, like uh, maybe previous century, like what you see is what you get, a WYSIWYG, and now <laughs> it's the WCU. Like what you see is unclear. So the problem also with these things, what we are showing is that it's interesting, like you can think about it, but it's still also for us a little bit difficult to understand what it, what it, is, what is, what it is actually. But we see that it's, actu that it's usable and that, that we can uh, work with it. So, for example, uh, recently we made a font uh, called uh, Variable Font uh, Television. And this looks like that. It's just like a grid. And so this is uh, uppercase, and there's also lowercase. <laughs> but, yeah, of course, you see that this does not make sense. So... Uh, we have to think differently how to design our fonts. So instead of, like, we have to look at other mediums. Like, for example, if, a radio, if, I, have a, if I have a radio, I can listen to the ra with this radio to all radio stations. And if I have a, w a computer, like, it's clear for us. Like, with one computer, I can visit all websites. So in that way, perhaps we also have to uh, just accept that with this new font, we have just have, like, uh, one entity cliff, which can generate everything we want to have. So one cliff is enough. <laughs> and like the term font, of course, comes from the French, and it means like something which has been. So in that way, entity means something which will be, or which will develop. So when you work with this font, it's quite different than working with the normal fonts. So for example, if you have this, uh, Two words, be able, this is how we work, like with a, a monospaced font. And then if we would use this uh, television font, it looks like this. But, of course, we can control it, so we also have an interface for that, and we can just, like, for example, uh, do this then. Let's yeah, you see. could, for example, take the same previous letters and then display them on your TV font. And that, that would be easy. But once you've displayed it on your TV font, then it can be have any other shape as well. So maybe it could also look like this. And it, again, this is it's important. Like it looks like a, a, f a fake uh, image we made in Photoshop or something. But this is built with a real font. So a you have to imagine font. that it's like there's still like the be able is standing there, but we are using this font to just create what we want to have, because we can talk to this uh, typeface and we can just do with it whatever we want to have. And because we can do this like, not only like once, but we can do it like continuously, we can also change this into an animation, and then it will look like that. So again, this is not a film, but it's like a typeface, what you look at, it's a font. The, uh, uh. <laughs> So this, it, it's like, this is all possible with variable fonts, and it looks like we opened a new door, which like, the people who created this font format opened a new door where we don't know which room it actually is. Uh, and we're still figuring it out. Like, we, like, we're still wondering about it. And we're just playing around, and uh, with these kind of experiments, we made our own website now for it. Uh, and you know, of course, what those websites should be. It's <laughs> veryablefonts.com. And it's live since today, so you can, like, all some experiments which we made, we just collected them there, so you can just play around yourself. Drag the sliders. Okay. Second part, the type. 
Um, what you could say if you, uh, everybody will sometimes still write with a pen. So once you take your pen, you start to write, and once you start writing, you're already designing. Because you define like the shape, you define the rhythm, the size, the, the tool you're using, all defines like the look of your text. So I think it's pretty safe to say that writing is designing. But nowadays, very often people, when they write, they are not writing by hand anymore, but they are typing. So, and typing is all digital. So in that sense, it's pretty safe to say that typing is already designing. It's a question. <laughs> For example, this is a, just, you start typing a text, you have this font, and then it, it looks like this. And you, this is a font, we made duos, and uh, you start designing it while typing it. And there are a lot of things going on in here, so that when you make a font, there are many things happening. So you put intelligence inside a font which do all these things automatically. So you can see, for example, that these Y, are, they are different all the time. Uh, there's a ligature from the OL. Uh, there's a uh, ligature from the ER. There are the different E's in there. And there's a TT. And if you would probably write TT, and then you make one stroke. And if you come... Yeah. So for us, it's very difficult to, when we design these typefaces, to get all this knowledge into this typeface, because you just want to have it like if people type that they get this result. And so for all these little elements, what you see, like ligatures and uh, uh, swappers and so on, there's a little program and they interact with each other. And we just want to quickly uh, let you show like how this uh, T-topper, for example, works, because that's something what you really do when you write by hand. You always check like how much space there is for making this like uh, T-bar. So we made a little program, and this program takes care on the space, how much space it has to create this perfect uh, T-line. So if you have, for example, this word uh, billeta, and of course the, the, the typeface will rec recognize that there's an E, E, but also an L, so I can make a, like a T-bar, double T-bar, but it should not be too long. So if I have a different word, if I change, for example, from uh, billeta, to, uh, let's say, uh, pirouette, then there's much more space. So also the typeface should recognize that and should also make, of course, a longer T. So when you type pirouette, it will automatically place those uh, uh, letters correctly. And then if you change this word again from pirouette to quintette, then we have this like, nice word with uh, a single T and a double T, and then it gets really into like, designing because you really want to have those connected. So you make a longer uh, bar there. You don't have to worry. This all goes automatically within the font. And um, this is a handwriting font. And what you get with a handwriting font, like basically any font which is painted or uh, drawn, it has a certain speed. And the speed is a very important factor for how a font looks like. So if imagine you could say Roman inscriptions are painted at a very slow speed. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there are, sh there are handwritten shopping lists which have a, the highest speed possible. Then probably Bello and Lisa are rather slow, and Duos is getting to the edge of the spectrum. Like it's super, super, super fast. So you have this handwriting speed there, like a very hand fast handwriting speed. And can you try to put this handwriting speed into the font as well? That's a question. So uh, we looked at it, and uh, the idea was also to make out of this font like a verbal font, which is then really like a handwritten. And then we really have to see like what's the speed, the writing speed, when you would draw such a letter. And there's basically like uh, two parameters which is defining that. The first one is the direction. Whenever I, whenever I go like uh, uh, up, it's slow. Whenever I go down, it's fast. So if you look at the lowercase o again, you see like on the left, of course, the speed is slower than where I would go down. So that's, that's very important to make it look natural. That's the way we write. And the second uh, important parameter is the curvature. Whenever you have like straight lines, you really go fast. And whenever there's a curve, you have to slow down to get the curve uh, correctly. So looking again at the, lower, at the o, you see that the a is really fast because it's straight. And with uh, section B, that gets slower because it goes around the curve. And now, the 
interesting thing is we showed that uh, to somebody uh, two weeks ago, and then he said like that, but wait, I'm an animator. I, I want to animate your typeface. And then we had a discussion about that, because the problem is when you make like an animated uh, variable font, which is like uh, simulating handwriting, I believe that the animation is part of the font design and not something which should be done by an animator. But that's, of course, the big discussion what uh, comes up. And the nice thing about being a type designer these days is that you, can have, you have this idea, but you can already put this all into a font. Uh, so this is a small tool which uh, helps us then to define this whole animation. Um, you can come up with this many different other tools as well. And you can define, predefine menu, uh, you can predefine like uh, the, how many steps you want, how, how fast the thing should be. And meanwhile, you can still edit all the old outlines. So it's not like a process which happens after you finish the font. It's like it happens while designing the font. It's like animating becomes part of the design process of making a typeface. So this is how the uh, typeface looks like if you use it on a website. It's again like a normal oh, font, and then there's a very little, like a, uh, let me see, very little. Uh, no, should come. No? Yeah. OK. Well. There's a little uh, JavaScript plugin, and with this, you can just like, yeah, write this headline, and then this headline will be written. So you can do it like from left to right, or all the same time, or whatever you want. And again, this is not a movie, like a streetcar. This is a real font on a website. So you can just you can still select and copy paste it, which I think is very important because then the text still remains text. So Google can still find that your search engine. You can still make a PDF and find it later on. And if you make a movie out of it, 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 it all this information is lost. So all the information is still there, but you have a full control on the shapes, on the appearance of the text. It's also important if you would not have like a real text, then for example the website could would not be accessible for blind people. So that's also uh, important, the accessibility. accessibility. Ac inclusivity, all there. So when you, again, think about like what are typefaces and what are letters, then the most, like, the first idea which comes up is, of course, letters are kind of typified language because there's just like uh, there's thousands way of pronouncing a letter A, but in, uh, on a typeface, I only have like uh, one letter A. And so there's always this discussion about this like a difference between uh, uh, speaking and uh, writing. And there's like uh, some people who uh, uh, say that the speaking is much richer and the other people would say like the writing is much richer. And in instead of like having this discussion, like what is more important or what is better or, or what was first, you could also just take your own discipline and like see what you can do with that. And taking like, uh, for example, the written word, we could uh, look how we could like expand or compress this. How could we create new possibilities? How can we get uh, new perspectives on uh, the written word? And the interesting thing is that this is not something which only designers are doing, but also writers are doing. And there's uh, uh, Arno Schmidt, German writer, who was very, very good in like playing with language and showing us like the additional uh, things or things within language which would not be like visible for the normal reader. And I'm very happy that we could uh, convince uh, Dutch writer uh, Kieset Hutt to join us tonight. Can we perhaps put the light uh, on him, please? <laughs> because uh, I'm, I, uh, I know Case already for a couple of years. And we were talking about this also, like a written text. And then he was telling me, like, yeah, you have to listen to me. Like, that's a very important uh, uh, story, what I, what, I, what I would like to tell. And I think that we should also listen more to each other, like that designers and authors and writers and, uh, and composers, that we should uh, uh, talk more with each other. So therefore, I'm very happy that uh, Case can tell us a little bit about Arno Schmidt and why this is so like, uh, special. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before we come to Arno Schmidt, I, 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 
I will make some remarks about meaning and, and especially hidden, hidden meaning in words and the meaning of inter, interpunction that has to do with it. Words have a meaning, you know, and, and novels have a meaning. I will talk about novels to you. Uh, for instance, the novel Anna Karenina from Tolstoy has a meaning. This meaning is not stated in the novel itself. We discover it by means of interpretation. Uh, you can say the meaning of the novel Anna Karenina is being unfaithful has many bad consequences. That could be an interpretation of it. Uh, let's take another novel like uh, Madame Bovary. Uh, maybe the meaning of that novel is it's better not to believe in your dreams because it, it, it will kill you. These, these kinds of words are not in a novel itself, but we can take them from them. Uh, let's take another Moby Dick. Uh, to hunt the wild whale is to hunt your defeat. Uh, it's, it, it's not good. It Maybe it's better not to, to hunt your obsessions. That could be the meaning of Moby Dick. But is meaning in the book itself or is, is it in the reader? That it's reading the book. Okay, that's point one. Freud made a very interesting theory of meaning in the Traumdeutung. I, I'll come to Arno Spitt. And, and he, he differentiated between the manifest dream, that's the dream we have, we can, these images, that's the manifest dream, and a, a latent dream, that's the hidden meaning of the dream. And that's a very important thing. And one of his most interesting insights goes like this. I'm not quoting him now. But he, he says, don't bother about the meaning that a dream seems to have. Because that's not the latent meaning of the dream. So if you're dreaming about you're your sitting in a boat and crossing a river or, or something, you, don't think that it's about sitting in a boat and crossing a river and that you, uh, that's had nothing to do with it. Uh, Freud compares dreams with rebuses, with image cryptograms. And a, a, a dream is a structure of images and it must be deciphered. So we must deciphere the manifest dream, the dream we have, and then we get a latent dream. And, and uh, in the psychiatry, it goes like this, that there is a psychiatry, and he asks the dreamer, what is the meaning of your dream? That's, that's how it goes in the psychoanalysis. Let's, let's try to make for this, this afternoon, is it possible to make a comparison between dreams and literature? So let's do that today. A dream, it, it, and maybe it's right to do that because when we dream, we see images, but when we tell the dream to our friends or our relatives, it's a story. So maybe we, we can compare it. A dream is a story when you tell them to somebody. So we can state, we can, we can examine a manifest story and a latent story. We can guess, okay, let's, uh, let's see the novel as the manifest text, and what is the latent text in the novel? Is there a latent text in the novel, like there is a latent dream in the dream? So let's try this. In the psychiatrist, it, a lot of people had, has tried to do that. There is a famous, uh, for instance, uh, 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 from Jacques Lacan, he had a client, a woman, and she dreamt about piranhas, you know, these little fishes and, 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 and piranhas, but in the word pira, piranhas, in French, it's pire ana. Pire ana, piranha. And this woman, she declared the, the dream like, well, well, this ana, she hated a woman. She was not called ana, but she hated a woman. And pire ana is in French something like dead to ana or ana is bad. So, so the latent dream is Pira Anna, and the manifest dream is, is Piranhas. Well, that's, that's interesting. So, it really is. So, maybe there, in novels, maybe there, is, there are hidden words, and maybe the, we, can, we can state like, 
the meaning of a novel like Madame Bovary, it's not the meaning that I just told you. No, no, it's something very different. And Arno Schmidt, he did that with the work of Karl May. Uh, some of you remember Karl May with Old Shatterhand and Winnetou. It's stories about cowboys and Indians, these kind of stories, and sometimes it's plays in the, in the Middle East. It's a famous German writer. I read, uh, when I was a boy, I read a lot of these stories. And he says, uh, Arno Schmidt says, it has nothing to do with cowboys and Indians. And he wondered by himself, why was I so interested in these novels from Karl May? What, what triggered me to read this? And he stated, it, and it's really funny, and he wrote this, 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 this essay book, and he stated, everything in the Karl May books is sexuality. Okay, let's laugh. Everything is homosexuality. And he made, he made, well, I think it's a great work. You can laugh a lot about it. And, and every, let's talk about Old Shatterhand. Isn't there something about masturbation is in this name? And he stated that. He stated that. And he looks all the time in all the works of Karl May. He sees it. He sees it. And, and it's very funny. When, uh, when there is a scene playing in Sierra de los Organos, okay, and Karl May writes that. And, and when we travel in Das Waldloch der Ulanen, Ulanen, he thinks that's, that's a homosexual, uh, Ul und Ab. I, I'm not sure about that. But, but he sees everything. And, and uh, we can wonder, is it Arno Schmidt who sees it? Or is it Karl May who wrote it? He is very convincing and very funny. And he thinks it's all a homosexual sub-meaning. Uh, and he calls that a homo sexuale centrale, and that's why he liked it so much. Okay, he called that Citara oder der Weg, der Weg dorthin, and, and, and for instance, there is a, a little, a, a, he examines a, a, a poem by Karl May, and that's go, that's go, uh, it goes like, zur Meer Stan im Walde von Kulub, okay, and then, then said he, Meer Stan, Merde, Merde is scheiße in Französisch. Merde is dan, so wo geht, wo geht er hin? Und cool up is, uh, I, I, I don't speak German so very well, but cool is the, the behind, it's behind, and cool up, okay, and he sees, immediately he sees some homosexual signs he sees there. Okay, we don't have to believe it, but when you read, when you read it, it's very funny, it's very funny. And, and let, uh, let's wonder about that. But I think, and I will demonstrate that to you, that uh, Mr. Schmidt didn't go far enough. <laughs> because, because what he didn't do was to leave all the in interpunction away. He just examined the words and the sentences. It's very funny. But I am busy the last couple of years by leaving all the interpunction, so all, not only the points and the commas, but also the pieces of white between the words. And I, I give you some, for the end of this, this speech, I give you a demonstration f from a very famous uh, German poem, Der Erl König, and maybe you can show it. Uh, I, I made this poem from Goethe unreadable. I made it unreadable. I left all the interpunction. Aber es lautet natürlich, wer reitet so spät durch Nacht und Wind? Es ist der Vater mit seinem Kind. Er hat den Knaben wohl in, und so weiter, und so weiter. Und dann kann man, you can, these, these words, you can, for instance, in, at the first line, it's, it's durch Nacht und Wind. Da, da steht, da, da gibt es Nachtun. Ah, What's going on here? And and wohl in the und 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 so weiter und so weiter und so weiter und so weiter. Maybe then we get the latent text of Freud, the Kerl König, and it's gibt uh, uh, there's a totally different text in it, hidden in it. Thank you.
Thank you, Case, for touching a very relevant point. <laughs> I mean that the text, who defines what the text is? Is it the reader or the writer? That's a very relevant point. And the same basically goes for uh, uh, when a designer makes a text, you can question like who defines the content? Is it like uh, the, the, the writer? Is it the designer who gives it a certain shape? Or is it the reader? So the same way as some people, like authors, try to compress or expand language, the same thing like uh, type designers can do or designers can do for language. Like language is, belongs to anybody. So in that way, nobody uh, forbids us just to add some characters. So when we have 26, we can also just make 47. And to understand what we actually uh, did is we look at this one uh, character. And so what this is, is you can look at it as an H, or you can also look at it as an A. So this letter does not have really like a specific definition, but we can just put it in our alphabet in between. So now we have 27. But if you do that with other letters as well, then you can put, come up to 47 maybe, or may, maybe even more. And that's only capital. So what happens if you do also make the same thing with lowercase? Then you get a very, very much expanded uh, alphabet. And maybe it gives you different possibilities to treat language. So mostly when we have a, uh, a word in a, in a set in a font, it's either love or it says hate. But with letters which are in between, maybe you can also write something which is both. Uh, I, I showed it to somebody, and then he said, like, yeah, but wait, this looks like uh, uh, quantum physics, what you're doing here. And perhaps not everybody's uh, familiar with uh, quantum physics. I'm just wondering, do we have sound for the computer also, because the next film has sound? Yes? Okay. So we can show it to that. Okay. Uh, very simply, normal computers work uh, by... Uh, <laughs> No, no, no. Don't, don't interrupt me. When you walk out of here, you will know more. Well, no, some of you will know far less about quantum computing, but most of you. Normal computers work uh, either there's power going through a wire or not. It's one or a zero. They're binary systems. Uh, what quantum states allow for is much more complex information to be encoded into a single bit. Regular computer bit is either a one or a zero, on or off. A quantum state can be much more complex than that because, as we know, uh, things can be both particle and wave at the same time, and the uncertainty around quantum uh, states uh, allows us to encode more information into a much uh, smaller computer. So uh, that's what's exciting about quantum computing, and that's what we're doing. Um, don't, don't get me going on this, or we'll be here all day, trust me. Uh, we couldn't explain it better ourselves. So translating this into our typeface, it's rather simple. We can just do this because now 7 minus 6 is 1 and 7 minus 0 is of course 7. <laughs> so with uh, quantum physics, I, the, they always say the problem is between the observer and the particle. So it's who is defining what is there. And with uh, quantum topography, it's about uh, between the reader and the text. And so with the quantum physics, it's like because this zero and one, it's both at the same time. It's also everything at the same time, probably. And so what we can do now that we have quantum topography is we can also make a, a new language. And that's like the owl, which is consisting out of one word. And it, it's perhaps a little bit difficult to understand, but it's not so difficult at all. So we have our like, a Latin script, and we have our uh, additional glyphs. And so we can write a word with different glyphs. So if we have this single word, one word, we can write this actually in like thousands of different uh, uh, variations. So uh, like this or like this, and it goes on and on and on. So with a single word, I can make enough 
variations which somehow always say like one word, but they are all different because they are using this uh, polysemic uh, cliffs. So that's the first step I have to do. I have to define all those like thousands of variations of my one word. And the next step I have to do is I just take English, for example, and I map the English words to my owl words, to my one word language words. And once I do this, I get my dictionary. <laughs> so you see that all the one words are uh, different. So for example, the second one has starts with an O, which also looks like a B. And so we have this dictionary, so we can start uh, writing our, our stories in, uh, in OWL. So for example, this is uh, English text, and then we can translate this to OWL, which looks like uh, this. <laughs> but we showed it to some people, and they said, like, yeah, what's the logic behind it? Why do you do that? What's, what, why, does it make sense? Yes, it does make sense, because now comes this uh, quantum uh, typography uh, thing. So we start with this one sentence, in the beginning was the word. When we translate this to owl, we get this. When we translate this like uh, a retro, like retro translation to English, we get this. So in one word, one word was the one word. And if we take this again and translate this to uh, OWL again, we get this. And if we take this again, translate it to English, we get this. One word, if there was one word beginning. And we do it once more, we get like this in OWL. And again, the last one will be like, uh, and if there was no beginning. If you watch carefully, you will also think, like, mm, that's rather strange. Like, it doesn't make so much sense that you have all these long words, and many of these words are, like, have similar parts. Uh, oh, wait, one, one back first. Basically, yeah, like, so they have this one word, and this one word contains every word which is there. So basically, you could say that this one word is like the, uh, like the uh, Library of Babel from Borghese's story, but then united in one word. But you can see, like, if you have this list of, of words, you can see many parts of the words are identical in one word to the other word. So what you could do for the experts is that you remove all those parts which are identical. So these are the same, so you could basically just chop them off. And then if you chop them off, like, the whole dictionary becomes uh, much shorter. And this is like the expert level, like, uh, for the owl. So this is a uh, standard OWL, <laughs> and the next one is uh, OWL Pro. <laughs> so when you do this, you also like st start to ask yourself, like, uh, why do we have 26 letters? Why not 47? Or why not, like, how many do we need? Hmm. And, of course, as a designer you can do this, uh, authors will also do it. Probably the most uh, famous example of this is uh, a French author, Georges Perec, who wrote his book, where there's no lowercase e appearing in the book, which is very hard because it's the most uh, used character in, uh, in many languages. Um, but you can write, as an author, you can write with 25 letters instead of 26. You don't need all of them, probably. And like maybe as a type designer, like, you, maybe you can do the same thing. Like, maybe you don't need 26 letters. So instead of having 26 letters, you can also just do the same thing with three shapes, maybe. When we found out about that, we were very surprised that already three shapes are enough. So what are we doing? <laughs> We've been but wasting our time all these years. But then when we looked further, we could actually find out, find out that we could do even have one shape. So maybe this is all you need. Maybe there's this protoglyph in there which contains everything. <laughs> we don't know, it's a question. It's, uh, we have lots of questions. So when we were doing that, 
we were like also like getting somehow confused. <laughs> and then we were also like looking into history, like when was there another moment where people were playing around with the language and discovered something uh, surprising? And indeed, there was like exactly 100 years ago here in Berlin, the very first uh, Dada Soiree. It was, I think, at the uh, Kurfürstendamm. And of course, we all know Dada because they also like were playing with language. They were using language to pronounce or to generate sounds. So not information, but purely like generating sounds and tones and so on. So that's also like from 100 years ago from uh, Raoul Hausmann. And so this he calls like Lautgedicht. And this Lautgedicht was then later on, a couple of years, uh, taken by uh, Kurt Schwitters as the first line of his uh, Ursonate. And so he calls this uh, sonata mit der uh, Urlauten. And if you look, like, what is this uh, 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 Ursonata, like, what is it actually trying to achieve, then it's basically that uh, they are using type to generate sound. So uh, that's what they were doing, like, 100 years ago in Berlin. So we thought it's exactly 100 years have passed since then, so we thought today we could try to do the opposite. We take sound and then convert that back into letter shapes. <laughs> and we are very happy that uh, we have uh, another person with us on stage. Uh, yeah? No? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Jacques Palings, <laughs> please give him a warm welcome. He's a guitarist. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, no, that's good. Don't do it. No. Now, the idea for this uh, uh, to translate sound into, uh, into type came also again from these uh, variable fonts, because those variable fonts we just showed, they are getting very, very complex. And so when everything is possible, it's very hard to uh, control it. So in that way, we had this variable font, but we could not really control it. So we said, like, okay, let's just ask a composer to, uh, to compose a piece of music for it and perform it. So that's like uh, the bar sonata für Gitarre und Letter. Uh, I have to start it up.
And so, yeah, 100 years ago, by this uh, soiree uh, here just around the corner, they also like, uh, handed out a little uh, publication for the audience. And it was uh, the uh, Stadaistische Manifest from uh, Richard Hülsenbeck. And so we thought, like, with this uh, special uh, evening with uh, Jacques and uh, Case, that we should also do a little. Uh, publication which you can take with you so and if you want you can take one of these home made for tonight with even more questions uh, if you want more questions to go ho take home <laughs> then read this and everything will be clear <laughs> it has the same uh, title as the title of the lecture it's the tale of the cat and if it's still not clear then this movie will explain it all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, super, super. Thank you. <laughs> hey, put it on. Well, I think uh, they, they say that people were asking them what they actually do. I think they've turned the question around on us and asked us what we're actually doing. Uh, that's something we can ponder tonight at uh, the Type of Night Party House Ungarn. We'll meet at 10 p.m. Uh, and, and bring your badge to make sure you can get in and we'll all think about this over a drink. Thanks everybody for coming to Typo. Thank you.